I'm so excited to be here. But I have to tell you why I'm so excited to be here, because there's a personal story. I actually have this boyfriend who's, and some of you uh, might have friends like this, who's a little bit of a know-it-all. And we have an ongoing fight. I mean, this one's big. And it started uh, a couple years ago where he has a um, son-in-law. And the son-in-law is in college, and the son-in-law wants to go to Berkeley for uh, business school. So the son-in-law, we were sitting around the table around Thanksgiving, and the son-in-law said, um, yeah, you know, I hope I get into Berkeley for business school one day. And he said, well, you know, if you don't get into Ber Berkeley for business school, you could just always go to Stanford night school. <laughs> I said, there is no night school at Stanford. What are you talking about? He goes, no, there is. You could take courses at night. I said, if you don't get into Stanford, there's no correspondence course you could take or any night school. It does not work. This is not community college. So he said, there is night school at Stanford. This has been going on for two years, just so you know. So I said, listen, I know you don't know things about colleges and universities and business schools like this. Um, I did go to Princeton. I know there's no night school at Princeton. So you don't get a degree from Princeton from going to night school. It doesn't work like that with world-class universities. So long story short, when I got the invitation to come here and my friend Nancy Gross reached out to me, who was... Uh, at Princeton when I was there, I said, of course I'm coming. And on top of that, I've got to find the dean of the business school to write a letter on Stanford Business School paper that just on hand that says there is no night school at Stanford. <laughs> So you can see this has become an obsession with me, a big issue. And we are actually flying out to go to Miami uh, later today. And I said, I am bringing the note with me. <laughs> so just as an FYI. So that's one reason why I'm excited to be here. The other reason I'm excited to be here is I uh, am so passionate about the topic that I'm going to talk about today. It's one that I think has broad impl implications for all of society. I know you see Ariel Schwab Black Investor Survey. This is not just a black issue that I want to talk about today. I want to talk about something that I think is a crisis that is unfolding in real time, and we're all standing around and watching it. But I want to back up a little bit and tell you a little bit more about our company and me, just as a way of setting up the story that I'd like to talk about. Our firm has been in business for 25 years this year. So this is a milestone year for us. 25 years in business. My business partner who started the firm turned 50 a couple weeks ago. And so it's really one of those years where you sort of sit and take stock of all the things that you do. It's actually one of the reasons that we're changing our name this year. We're changing our name to Ariel Investments because right now we have two names as a company, Ariel Capital Management for our, mutual, for our institutional business and Ariel Mutual Funds for our mutual fund business. So on Monday, we become Ariel Investments because we're looking forward to the next 25 years of what we want our company to be. I've been at the firm, as I already mentioned, for 17 years. This is the only job I have ever had. And Princeton says that out of the graduating class of 1,100 students, I'm the only person who has had the same work and home phone number since I graduated from college. <laughs> so you get a sense that consistency and things like that are important to me. But I've also had the opportunity to work at a really, really amazing place, do unbelievably great work, clearly having a very strong eye towards hitting the cover off the ball for our clients and the people who trust their pension money and their retirement money and their kids' college education to us. But also, what I always like to say about what we're doing at Ariel, we're doing something that is so much bigger than us, so much bigger than even the work of investing, where we have this unique opportunity to move the needle on something, as I said before, that affects all of society. Now, our firm came into existence in a very um, wonderful way. My business partner, John Rogers, started our firm when he was 24 years old. He had been uh, exposed to the stock market in an extraordinarily unusual way. Starting when he was 12 years old, instead of toys, his father gave him stocks every birthday and every Christmas. Now, I put the big emphasis on instead of because he says in the beginning it was not very fun. He would run to the tree, and the only thing that he would get was a white envelope. And he said the worst part, if it wasn't bad enough that you get the white envelope, no toys, that 
We all know what happened on Christmas Day and the days after Christmas. What do you do? Call your friends. What'd you get? And he said his friends would say, oh, I got the newest G.I. Joe. And another friend would say, I got Monopoly. And John would say, oh, I got IBM shares. (laughs) That was his existence. And he said, but the one thing that his father did that was incredibly smart was that he allowed him to keep the dividend checks. And he said, the two things you don't get when you're 12 years old, you don't get mail with your name on it. Now think about it. I remember occasionally I'd accidentally get the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes and I'd be running around the house because I had a letter. So you don't get mail, and even more so today because kids are online, right? And then the second thing you don't get, you don't get checks with your name on them. So he said it didn't matter if the checks were for 50 cents or $50. He was getting this free money in the mail, and he got very, very excited about it. So he says he was a 12-year-old with cash flow. If he wanted to buy a candy bar, he could. But one of the things that he realized is that if he reinvested the dividends, because his father was buying these blue chip stocks for him, and just by way of uh, just putting the story in context, John's family wasn't wealthy. His father was a Tuskegee Airman who went to college on the GI Bill, went to University of Chicago Law School where he met John's mother, the first black woman to graduate from the University of Chicago Law School. I love the story. I asked John Roger, who turns 90 this year, How did you end up going to the University of Chicago Law School and give you a sense of the practicality of this man? He said, the line was shorter. (laughs) So that tells you what we're dealing with here. So very, very practical. But he had had a, a hard start. He was an orphan who was a child of the Depression. It was incredibly important for to him that John understood and respected money. So that's where this bias of giving him stocks came from. So jump ahead, John's graduating from high school. He goes to Princeton where he played basketball. His coach told him he had no future in basketball. So he decided that the only other thing that he loved was the stock market. So he decided if you love the stock market, you become a stockbroker. He went and worked at William Blair and Company, the first black professional ever to work at William Blair in their history. He quickly started to realize that the the investment world was more than just being a broker because he had never had that perspective. But the great thing about Blair is that everything was under one roof there. So they had corporate finance, public finance, asset management, mutual funds, and he discovered the whole world of investing. So at that point, in financial services, I should say. So at that point, he realized instead of being a broker, he really should be a money manager because he had been developing this disciplined, patient approach to investing. We have a turtle as our logo, and borrowed from Aesop's fable of slow and steady wins the race. So his patient approach was not one that you were going to get quick, you were going to get rich being a stockbroker, because he had very, very, very few transactions with his clients. We own our average stock at Ariel for more than five years. We've owned Clorox for my entire 17 years that I've worked at Ariel, as an example. So we're not the firm that is moving in and out of things. We are buying and holding very much like Warren Buffett does. So at the, at the end of the day, he started to realize, maybe I should be in this other aspect of the business. So he went to the powers that be at Blair, and he said, I'd like to work on the asset management side. And they said, hey, listen, kid, you're 24. You have no experience doing this. You have no clients. We couldn't, in good faith, give you people's pension money to manage. So John decided, well, if he couldn't do it at Blair, he'd go off and start his own company. So he said he's the accidental entrepreneur because he couldn't get hired there, so he went and hired himself. Now, interestingly, all the Blair partners were extraordinarily helpful in the founding of Ariel and in our ongoing development as a business, put us in touch with all the right people to get the business started, because there's a lot to do when you start an investment firm. And ultimately, as we like to say, things worked out. So we started the firm. We were the first minority-owned money management firm in the nation in 1983. As hard as that is to believe, because we all hear about hedge funds, venture capital, all these things going on today, 9,000 mutual funds. 9,000 mutual funds in the newspaper. We are the 9,000 mutual funds. 500 of them are in the newspaper. We're the only minority company that has mutual funds in the newspaper every day. So when you think that there's, we've come a long way, in my mind, and based upon what we see every day, we still have an extraordinarily long way to go based upon the, the, um, the way that the industry is shaped out and the lack of uh, minority participation in some aspects of the financial services industry. So he starts the firm, gets his first client. Uh, first million-dollar client was municipal employees of Chicago. First client was Howard University. Both are still clients today. 
And slowly the firm started to build and you know, the rest is history as they say. Now I start off with John's story because John's story is such a unique story about being socialized to the stock market and investing. Completely different than my story. So my story is that I am the youngest in my family of six kids. And my oldest sister is 25 years older than me. Same mother. <laughs> Needless to say, when I was growing up, five girls, one boy, my siblings made it clear that I was not planned. And they would say it regularly, you know, things like your sister's 25 and you're 30 years old and you're five. And she says things like, we were so nice to take you in when we found you on the doorstep. Yeah. So as I like to tell people, I'm still not quite right, but at least you understand and have some compassion for why that might be. But when I was growing up, we didn't, we had a boom and bust life. That's the best way to describe it. My mom was a single mom, six kids. And again, I, like, I can't even fathom that, right? Six kids. She had four kids. She got married when she was 18 and had four kids when she was 22. She had one in a row for four years. I mean, it's just mind-boggling. But she had six kids, single mom, and she was in real estate. And so we had this sort of boom and bust. Sometimes we'd have money. Sometimes we'd literally get evicted. Phone disconnected all of those things. No one ever talked to me when I was growing, about, uh, growing up about the stock market or investing. And most times we were sort of trying to make ends meet. But the one thing that I think happened to me during that period, I hated it so much. I hated that sense of insecurity and that sense of not knowing what would happen that I don't think it's an accident I actually ended up in the financial services industry and working for an investment firm. Because for the same reason John's father wanted him to understand money, I actually myself wanted to understand it so that I could be financially secure. And I think it's part of the reason that I am so passionate about the topic of financial literacy and what I think is going on in society. So that was my perspective. I came to Ariel as an intern between my sophomore and junior year. Between my junior and senior year, I went and worked at T. Rowe Price for their portfolio management team that runs their famous New Horizons Fund. I always like to tell people I got my job at T. Rowe Price because Ariel was the largest shareholder of T. Rowe Price. And John called them and asked them if I could work there. And the joke at T. Rowe is that they were training me for John, which is okay. So I ended up coming back to Ariel after I graduated from college, slowly rising up through the organization through incredible work, as you all have done and know so well, so it's nothing that is unusual to you. And ultimately, in May of 2000, became president of the firm. At an unusual situation in that when I was very young at the firm, John told me I was going to be president. And he told me that our board said I had to be 30, which I have to be honest with you, kind of pissed me off. <laughs> I was not happy about that, but they felt that I needed to mature as a person and mature as a, a leader, and that hard work alone, which was something I was famous for during those years, was not enough. And so at 30, they lived up to their commitment and made me president. I'll never forget when John told me, we had um, gone to meet with Jay Sherrod, and I don't know if you know that name. Jay Sherrod ran a very famous investment management firm called Miller, Anderson, and Sherrod that ended up being bought by Morgan Stanley. Very, very well known, very famous in the investment business. And we always would go out to try to meet with people to learn from them. So Jay had gone to Princeton. He had been on the board of Princeton when John was there. And John said, we'd love to just get some advice for you about the business. And Jay said, well, the only time I could really meet with you is when I'm on a train going from New York to Philadelphia. So we flew to New York just to get on the train to ride to Philadelphia with him so that we could ask him questions along the way. And I remember we were sitting on the train and we had prepared and you know, had very specific things we wanted to ask. And John said, well, you know, Melody's going to be president one day. I was like 23 years old. And I'm looking at him like, what are you talking about? But he said, you know, I want to just make sure we start training her today for the job that she's going to have and all that I need her to do. Now, I think it was actually a very unusual and smart thing because then I knew what I was working towards. I never had wanderlust. I never wondered about the grass green greener on the other side of the fence. I knew my future was secure and I knew where I was going. So I ended up uh, being president. But all along the way, one of the things we started to see as we were going out into lots of different communities is that there was this disconnect in terms of audiences, in terms of just investors at Ariel between African Americans and white Americans. And we started to see more and more, just regardless of race, there was a financial literacy issue going on in this country that actually started to come to a boil. And the reason it started to come to a boil is that more and more companies have gotten rid of the traditional pension. 
You have your 401k plan. You go, you get your first job. You pick your investment options that have huge implications for not only the rest of your life and your retirement security, but also what wealth you'll pass on to children or grandchildren. So real implications. And we said, we are, as a society, handing the keys to people's financial future, but we have not taught them how to drive. And we start to realize there is a huge, huge problem going on in this country when it comes to just knowing the basics about investing. So I decided to test the thesis. You know that I work on Good Morning America once a week and World News Tonight as well. I do all their stories on the stock market and investing. So we start, I said, I'm going to stand on the street and ask people financial terms in downtown Chicago and see what happens. And I'm going to show you a very quick excerpt of the video to show you what I think is at hand for this society. If you could roll the first video, please. Well, we thought we'd put financial contributor Melody Hobson on this and see what she could find out about what we all really know. She's president of Ariel Capital Management in Chicago. She invests a lot of money for a lot of people, and she joins us now. You made the point to me, which I think is interesting, that each of us thinks we're the only person who doesn't exactly know what a bond is, for instance. That's right. And the amazing thing, people feel so, you know, I'm, I'm stupid or I'm disappointed in myself. And actually, how would you know you don't learn about investing in most schools in America? You went to the street to see if you could find out exactly what people do and don't know. And what the first question you were asking was about the S&P 500. Do you know the answer at home? Here's what happened in the street. What does S&P 500 stand for? I do not know. Um, I don't recall. Was it Stanley? Stanley Morgan and Horse? I don't know. 500, I assume, is a volume number? And you said that you thought somebody thought it was a car race, like the Indy 500. That's right. <laughs> what did people think a bear market was? What is a bear market? when the market is good. I know there's the bear and there's the other one, <laughs> the lion or whatever. A bear market? I think that's one when you buy, 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 buy. No, that's the bull market, I think. I never understand those terms. And in fact, a bear market? Bad. The market is going down, usually 15% over a six-month period. The opposite is a bull market. We want to figure out why they call them bull and bear. Some say bears hibernate. Others say it has to do with how they kill their prey. Bulls take their horns and pull up, stock market going up. Bears bear down on their prey, stock market going down. Good way to remember. A bond, is, do we really know what, really, what a bond is? What is a bond? A bond? Uh, that I do not know. I cannot give you an exact definition. Uh, how do I define that? A bond belongs to the to the government. Bond is basically a um, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. So last thing, an IRA. Do people know what IRA stands for? Here it is. What does IRA stand for? I'm not sure, but I have one. <laughs> Investment retirement account. <laughs> The devil, no, uh, um, all right, I know an RS, the people I don't like. <laughs> okay, I know it's funny, right? And in the actual show, I gave all the answers. But this is the reality that society is looking at. And it's not funny when it comes down to, again, picking those retirement options and actually picking the investments for your kids' education or whatever it might be, and no one ever having told you how it is this works and how you do it. So this is the thing that actually makes me crazy. In Chicago, public school system, you can take, as an elective in a high school, wood shop or auto, but you cannot take an investing class. Now, this is what I find so interesting. I always like to ask a very simple question of audiences. How many people in this room cleaned their own carburetor? Because that auto class that maybe you taught, that's, that's one that maybe you took, maybe you learned that. Um, second question, how many people in this room whittle furniture in your spare time? 
right? My boyfriend took wood shop, he told me. He said he took metal shop as well. So just to give you a sense, this is not something that is so hard to believe. People actually, I, a person in my firm, I was, they came to watch me give a speech, and he said, I took electronics for three quarters in a high school in Chicago. So again, this is not something that is sort of made up, but you can't take investing. So the idea that every single day we all turn on the television, hear the radio, we get what I call the holy trinity, the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ, and no one ever told us what it was. Not to mention going much more beyond that for the essential things that we need to know as a society. So as a result of that, I have this mission. My mission that I wake up every single morning running is to make the stock market the subject of dinner table conversation in this country. Because I think if we do that, we'll actually shift this issue around financial literacy and ultimately have long-term financial security as a society. The reason I've made this my mission is because I think there's a crisis at hand. And I think we're going to look back on this period, and we are going to find that Rome was burning, and we were all standing around holding the cans of water. Because to the extent that we don't save or invest appropriately as a society, we will find ourselves, one, retiring to poverty, potentially, or being a significant burden on society, which obviously has huge social implications. So we've been doing this work with Charles Schwab and company right in the neighborhood here in the Bay Area for 10 years. And we've done something that no one has ever done before. The first year we did it by ourselves at Ariel. We did a survey on how do black people invest versus white people. Is there anything telling or intuitive there that could let us have a window into, into what is going on and maybe understand the problem and fix it? And we've been doing this for a very long time, as I said. After the first year, Charles Schwab came to us. They saw a story that was the lead story in the New York Times business, magazine, business section on a Sunday with John and I. And they said, we think you're really on to something. And we want to be the leaders in unbiased investor education, but we think you sit from a very unique vantage point, and we want to partner with you on this data on an ongoing basis. So hence became uh, the Ariel Schwab Black Investor Survey that has really become the defining work on what is going on with race in society when it comes to investing. There have been a lot of research on gender and investing. Never before we did this work have there been any work done on race and investing. Now, I know. I called every business school, all these professors who had specific um, interests. We couldn't find one piece of data on this topic until we started to do the research. Now, part of the reason that we've been so felt so strongly about this data is this cover story. Now, this came after we started the effort. But I don't know many, how many of you saw this New York Times from October 2005 magazine section. We regret to inform you that you no longer have a pension. Now, to you all, you know, young people like us, we never expected to have a pension. We haven't worked for companies with pension. But, you know, it wasn't too long ago that if you worked at General Motors or Ford Motor Company or, or whatever yeah, industrial company or even a regular consumer products company, You'd work for the company for 30 years, retire with a gold watch and a secure pension. That's the way it worked. And we all know family members and friends who count on their pension to sustain them. Well, these days it's not that way. If you work at Amazon or Microsoft or even Charles Schwab, there's no pension fund there. There's only a defined contribution 401k plan. And that 401k plan is you in the driver's seat making the decision about your financial future. And that means that it doesn't wreak havoc on corporate earnings and they can choose or not choose to make a match. So that is it's just sort of completely changed the paradigm, complete and total shift in how retirements will be funded in this country. Now, people always say to me, you know, you're bashing 401k plans, and I want to assure you I am not in any way. I'm a believer in 401k plans, and I like the ownership that an individual needs to take about their future. But the one thing I will tell you, when they were enacted 25 years ago, 401k plans were not ever meant to be the full retirement solution for an individual. It was meant to be supplemental. It has turned into the full retirement solution. On top of that, 80 million working Americans in this country have no access to any kind of company-sponsored retirement plan, 401k plan, or pension fund. So there are a lot of people that are completely left out that have to take the initiative on their own in order to secure their retirement by going out and saving and investing. Now, if that isn't bad enough, people always say, well, we've got this wonderful safety net in America called Social Security. 
And I like to call Social Security a safety net with holes. So if you're under the age of 40, it's pretty dicey if we're ever going to see Social Security because the system is actually going to go bankrupt in short order. So that's one thing. There'll be more people taking out of the system than paying into it, and we have not quite figured out how we're going to fix that because of the number of baby boomers who will be relying on Social Security. But, you know, that in and of itself, maybe that will be fixed. But I always like to put into context what Social Security really means. So I went out and did research. What is the average Social Security check in this country today? The average Social Security check in America today is $1,000 a month. Now, if you know anyone who can live on $1,000 a month, tell me who that is. $1,000 a month with no other income, you are in a very, very bad situation. $12,000 a year if you had no other retirement money. Now, just to give you a little more color, no pun intended on this issue, I asked my mother, who is turning 80 years old, she would kill me if she heard me say that, how much her Social Security check was. Now, you have to remember, in my mother's life, I'm her retirement plan, okay? Because she said, I sent you to Princeton, you know, with loans and everything, but she feels like she got me there and that it's just payback after that, right? That's how she sees the world. I don't know if you all have mothers like that, but my mother on graduation day told me what I owed her. So <laughs> just so you know, and she was not kidding, and I'm still paying. So long story short, my mother, I said to her, how much is your Social Security stack? Now, when she got past being appalled that I'd asked her the question, I said, Mom, you could really help my research on this. So I just need to know. I want a real person that I can talk about. So my mother's Social Security check, remember she had six kids and she was an entrepreneur, which means half the time she was not paying into any Social Security system. My mother's Social Security check is $400 a month. My mother's medication is $900 a month. Okay, so now you get a sense of why I'm scared to death about this issue. Because I think there are a lot of people in society where this is their fate. And that is not a fate that is acceptable to me, doing what I do every day, feeling like I have a bully pulpit to, to affect change. So I mentioned the world has changed. If you just look back to 1980, 40% of corporations had a pension. And a pension is not a bad deal. You work for the company, you're guaranteed 80%, sometimes 70% of your salary until you die. Not a bad deal. Now in 2006, only 20% of American companies are offering pensions. And I have to tell you, every day another pension fund dies. So they, they get canceled, they turn into a different type of plan. So this is a, an ongoing issue. Now, on top of the fact that pensions are going away, the one thing we also know, as a society, we are not saving enough. So we looked at people who are actually retired today, and we asked a specific question. How much do you have saved? Now, these are current retirees. 45% had less than $25,000 saved when they retired. That's half of retirees, less than 25%. So they're going to have that $1,000 a month Social Security deck that I'm telling you about. Now, I have to tell you, I, I'm sure, I'm not sure you guys uh, get this. I, I think you do. We get Social Security statements now, so it tells us what we can plan for. Mine says that I'm going to get $2,100 a month when I'm 65, which I don't think is going to buy groceries, right, when you add inflation and everything else. So 45% of people here had less than $25,000. 21% had between twenty-five dollars and $100,000. And a third, basically, had more than $100,000 saved for retirement. So this is the situation that we're looking at. Now, the thing about this situation that becomes even more challenging and something that we've worried a lot about is this situation changes when you looked at, look at it based upon race. So if this weren't bad enough when you look at all of society, we've been doing this research for a decade. So what is the median total savings black versus whites? A decade ago, we asked the question, African Americans on average had $30,000 saved for retirement. These are African Americans and white Americans making $50,000 in household income or more. Nearly identical age, about 50 years old, nearly identical education level. So these are two people virtually the same, just different colors of their skin. Black Americans had $30,000, white Americans had 68 on average. We asked the same question last year. The black number was $48,000 a decade later. The white number was 100. Half the savings. So again, the, it's not even that white 
the white individuals have enough money, but you cut that in half and you see that for minorities, this story gets worse. My mother always likes to say there's no bottom to worse. You know, things can get worse. This is one of those examples. There's no bottom to worse. Things get worse. So we looked at how much are we saving as a society. A decade ago, African Americans were saving $146. Today, $173. White Americans were saving $226. A decade ago, now $252. So we just in terms of the ongoing uh, amount of money that we're putting away, we're saving a lot less. Now, in addition to not saving as much as our white counterparts, the one thing that we also know from our research, we don't have the same exposure to equities. So as we all know, the stock market has outperformed all other investments since 1926. You need stocks in your portfolio for growth. If you're sending out the stock market, it's going to be very, very hard to grow your money and secure your retirement. So we asked a very specific question for a decade. Do you own stocks or stock mutual funds? Remember, almost identical scenario for both groups of people. 1,600 people in this random survey. In 1998, 57% of African Americans said that they own stock or stock mutual funds versus 81% of our white counterparts. Gaping hole. Now, this is the thing that is so discouraging. You look at the pink chart climb. By, 19, by 2002, we were at 74%. A lot of us jumped in, internet stocks, bubble, the stock market blew up. We completely sold out of our stocks, and white Americans just paired back. And look at how the white number is virtually flat over those years. So last year, we went back into the field and we asked, do you own stock or stock mutual funds a decade later? And much to my chagrin, after probably thousands of speeches, I feel like Al Gore. <laughs> That's the only way I feel like Al Gore. I say. <laughs> After literally, I've done so many speeches on this topic, I can't count. We were back at 57%. So I hadn't moved the needle at all. My, our data hadn't moved the needle. Waking up at 3 in the morning hadn't moved the needle to do television. Nothing. 57% versus for our white counterpart, 76%. Now, we, I know there's been a tough stock market. But many of us, it was our first time being stock market investors and seeing these kind, this kind of volatility. And when it happened, we ran for the hills. Now, a lot of reason that I believe we ran for the hills is because, again, we have not been taught how to do this. This is sort of learning as you go. First place that African Americans learn about the stock market investing is their company 401k plan. White Americans, interestingly, tend to learn before they get to their first job with some conversation with family or friends. So it comes a little bit earlier and our first exposure comes later. And when we are first being exposed, we're making all of these important decisions. And so you can see, and I tell people all the time, this is not in any way to cast my community in a bad light. Because again, there's a sense here, even though you're responsible as an individual, how would you know? And when you don't know about something and you've worked extraordinarily hard, like so many of the uh, minority people in this room, and you're the first person in your family actually making a good living, you don't go off and do something willy-nilly with something you don't know about. So you might start by putting your toe in the water a little bit, but this is not the easiest thing to approach, and it's especially difficult when you think about it, and I always like to say this to people. Imagine being a bus driver or a school teacher in Chicago. You're a nice, middle-class, black couple. Are you going to really walk into Goldman Sachs and the Sears Tower to talk about investing? That would be a daunting effort. Now, of course, you, Stanford Business School, that doesn't seem like a big deal to you. But, you know, just think about some relatives or, or people you've known over the years of how hard it would be, even with great intentions, to tackle this. And it's not like there's, I've already laid it out, a lot of diversity in the industry. There was a study a few years ago, there were 90,000 stockbrokers in the United States, and 600 of them were black. So again, it's not like even if you wanted to, you know who to pick up and call. And it's not that you just call the black person, but just where do you start based upon the, old, the social network and community that you have, right? So there's some disadvantage here. I'll give you one other point. In uh, 1994, we started advertising every single month in Black Enterprise Magazine. Black Enterprise premier black business and financial publication. We were the first mutual fund to advertise in Black Enterprise Monthly. First one. You could go into Black Enterprise during that period, and you could find every car ad, American Express ad, food ad. There wasn't one investment ad in a black business publication. 
Now you go flip through Forbes or Fortune and you can't count the ads, right? So we weren't even being marketed to. I'm glad to say that now you'll see a lot more mutual fund ads in black enterprise, which I think we had something to do with because I kept saying to people, this is a travesty. If you're Merrill Lynch or Goldman Sachs or whoever it might be, why aren't we good enough for the ad? Because we will be good customers once you just make us aware of what we might be missing. So it's not surprising that these numbers look the way they do. And I'm not saying that we don't share a role and responsibility here. And I'm hoping that a lot of this research becomes a wake-up call, not only for black America, but for all of America. So we see that the less of us have exposure to the stock market. The problem is when you compound the differences in our investments over time, it's ugly. So this is the 48 versus $100,000. Now, interestingly, remember, we don't have the same exposure to the stock market. I just grew the difference over 25 years at a 4% return versus an 8% return for the white money. The difference is it's over $500,000 difference compounded over time because we started off with half the money and it's growing half as fast. Now, we did some math and we tried to figure out what do you need to retire if you make $50,000 a year? Because remember, that's the group that we're surveying. A $50,000, a 40-year-old who makes $50,000 a year needs about a million one at retirement to sustain their ex exact lifestyle. So to be able to pull $50,000 a year out. We always tell people, just plan on needing 100% of what you make. The old rules used to say 70% because people would say, your house is paid for, and so you don't have that expense. Well, now the house expense has been replaced by health care costs. And so as a result of that, the number is still a very, very big number. So you need to plan on having 100% of your income. So you look at these numbers and you can see, again, both groups won't get there, but the African-American numbers are particularly startling, and it's something that has had us worry. So what we decided to do, we know that 401k plans are the gateway to investing for minorities. So we said, let's go look at some 401k plans. How do they look by race? Maybe if we could get companies to see that there's a difference, they'll change their marketing efforts, they'll be more attuned to this issue, they'll see that they have a responsibility to make sure that they are actively reaching out to their minority employees to get them on par with their white counterparts. Because what we fear is you'll have two people sitting next to each other in a cube with different color skin, and one will re retire with a secure retirement, same job, and the other one won't. And the company won't even, will not even have known that there was a difference or an issue or a problem there that they needed to think about. So we went to one of our customers, Great West Life Assurance Company. We manage a lot of money for them. They're one of the largest 401k plan administrators in the country. And we said, do you think you could look at real people by race and see if there are differences in terms of what people are contributing to their 401k plan? So they surveyed 20,000 people. They, may have, they, they oversee 401k plans for hundreds of thousands, but they did a 20,000-person sample. And this is what they found. African-American males contributed 20% less on average to the plan. I'm sorry, earned 20% less, contributed 58% less, account balances 75% smaller than white males, despite 33% more service. So we've worked longer make less, contribute less, and account balance that's a quarter of our white counterpart, male. African-American female, very, very similar, similar statistics. Now, I think it's one thing to look at percentages. Here are the numbers. These numbers scare me to death. The African-American male is making $49,000. The white male is making 61. The African-American male has two years more service, eight years. These are real people. This is not hypothetical. The white American male it has been there at the company on average for six years. The African American male is deferring less than 2% of his income. White male is deferring 4.5%. Now here's the part that actually is where my heart starts to skip a beat. The African American male balance is just under $12,000 and the white male balance is $47,000. $12,000 to 47,000. Real people, this is frightening. You cannot dig out of this hole without a major, major effort. I don't think people realize this. 
Now they went on and they found that we were less diversified, which makes sense because when the stock market cratered, our money wasn't diversified and spread out, so we ran for the hills. I mentioned that after the internet bubble burst. African Americans on average had 1.7 funds in their 401k plan. White Americans on average had 3.6. So that lack of diversification means that there's more volatility in our portfolio. So we tend to be more conservative and less diversified. The other thing that they found out, which I found so interesting, you know, the average American has 11 jobs in their lifetime. I've only had one, but that's what the statistics show. Now, they say the great thing about 401k plans, they're portable. You can take them with you, right? The problem is we aren't rolling ours over into IRAs. 4% of African Americans who left the job rolled it over versus 31% of our white counterparts. So not surprising that our account balances are much lower, right? 4% rolled it over versus 31%. And I, this is for emphasis because the, the, the dichotomy here is just startling. And I can tell you, I've been to the biggest mutual fund companies in America. I've been to the biggest brokerage firms. And I said, Houston, we have a problem. And people look at me like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And we show them this data and they're like, well, and I say just for selfish reasons, just think if you could increase these numbers, it'd be good business for you, right? Not to mention the fact that you'd have the community leaving more financially secure. So just so you didn't think that it was just one company we looked at, John and I went to every company where we're on the board. So I went to DreamWorks, Estee Lauder, and Starbucks. He went to McDonald's. Aon Insurance Company, and Exelon, which is one of the largest public utilities in America. So Exelon looked at this, and they have a lot of union workers, different types of groups. And I just want to show you one statistic. <clears throat> Saving rates were lower, but this is the one I wanted to show you. Not contributing enough to get the match. Free money, right? Free money. 34% of the African Americans who work for the company did not contribute enough to get the match versus 14% of the white Americans. Remember, same jobs, same <laughs> educational levers, 34% versus, versus 14%. Now, it's so interesting because I have a lot of African Americans who come to me and they say, I don't want to lose anything if I invest in your mutual funds because we invest in small and medium-sized companies. And I always like to explain to them, I said, well, you know, this is the thing. We're in the, for example, the Walmart 401k plan, which is a great plan to be in. Four million employees, great, great plan. So Walmart 401k plan, I went to Bentonville, and I did an investment class for all of the Walmart people. And so they were like, you know, we don't want to lose any money. And I said, well, this is the thing. Your company matches 50 cent on a dollar. So we all know this in this room. It's a 50% return, right? Right off the bat, you haven't done anything and you've already gotten a 50% return. So if you could just think of it that way, it will allay some of the concerns you have about being invested in the stock market. So one other place that we went, McDonald's. So okay, this is Golden Arches. How much do we all love McDonald's, right? I love McDonald's. When I was a little kid, I ate McDonald's every day. And I always joke with John, who loves McDonald's way more than me. And now I always joke with him, well, I'm still single, so I can't eat McDonald's, but you can eat it <laughs> as much as you want. And he's like, no, we have healthy food. I'm like, no, I don't eat the scone at Starbucks either. So just so you know. Or that Frappuccino, which tastes so good, but it's your calories for a day. Um, so McDonald's case study. So they looked at managers of their restaurants. Now this is something I did not know. It's a fascinating statistic about McDonald's. 30% of their corporate officers come out of their restaurants today, 30%. So the pipeline of their restaurants is a very, very important place for them to recruit their great talent. And that's why I think the Golden Arches people, McDonald's people, they bleed for that place. I mean, they really have a, a, a esprit de corps that I have never seen before. They still talk about Ray Kroc as if he's alive. No, they do. It's like, well, what would Ray say? You know, John comes back and brings me, he brought me the, John had to, as a board member, read the Ray Kroc biography, grinding it out, which I read as well because John was so, you know, taken with it. You know, he's practically weeping reading about Ray because that's the way that they have built that culture. And it works, trust me. It's a wonderful story, success story, and wonderful business story. So McDonald's looked at the restaurant managers. John asked the question in 2004, have you ever looked at your 401k plan by race? They did. 50% of their African-American restaurant managers were participating in their 401k plan versus 90% of the white restaurant managers. 
Okay, so just so we know that this isn't an elitist issue, this is McDonald's restaurant managers. 50% of the African Americans were in the 401k plan versus 90% of the white individuals doing the exact same job, right? So again, we see this over and over and over again. So they actually decided to do something about it. They put forth an effort that I think companies could learn from that it was phenomenal. One of the things that they did is they decided that they were going to automatically enroll everyone in the company in, a 401k, in the 401k plan. They were going to enroll them at 1% of their salary, and then they were going to give everyone in the company a 1% raise so that no one missed a nickel out of their paycheck. Not only did the black number go to 95% in three years, the white number went to 95%. So everyone got lifted in terms of participation, and account balances across the entire company, despite race, went up. Why did, this was the African-American restaurant managers. There in 2004, they had uh, $12.6 million on average in the, in the plan. It was up 41% by 2007. And so this, this, you can see, this is when you just sort of shine a light on this issue, you can actually see some real meaningful results. So before I close, I don't believe in just admiring a problem. That's what we call it at Ariel. We say if we're like kicking around an issue, we say we've admired the problem long enough. So I feel like I've admired this problem long enough. So there are three things that I, can be, I think that can be done to change the whole paradigm on financial literacy and retirement security in this country. First and foremost, I think the individual needs to understand it is a new day and we are all ultimately accountable for our own future. So this is our idea of thinking about the company taking care of us or Social Security. There's been a dramatic shift and some of us just haven't quite understood, oh my God, I'm in charge. So the individual ultimately bears full responsibility. I never want to um, move away from that. Secondly, I think every corporation should look at a 401k plan by race. I think if they saw the data, they would do something like McDonald's did. And that ultimately would have a positive effect, not only in terms of their relationship with their employees, but also in terms of making sure that they've done everything that they can to put their employees on the right path. Last but not least, and I know it won't come as a surprise to you, I think financial literacy should be taught in every school in America. That's my crusade right now, that I want every high school in America to have financial literacy and every grade school in America to have a financial literacy program. So we've done it at Ariel at one school, and I'd like to show you a little bit about it before I go. If you could roll the second video. Come on in, come on in. Now, what's the economic word for people that you're describing in your discussion? What are they, what are they? Good morning, Ariel. This is Dominic Williams and James Wett. The time is now 11.30 a.m. and it is time for the mid-morning market update. The Dow is currently down 5.0.4%. The NASDAQ is currently down 1.0.6%. The S&P 500 is currently down 1.0.11%. We have been investing in stocks such as Aeropostale, um, Tiffany's, Apple's, and Google. So we wanted to keep up with our money, so we did the market update so we can follow our stocks. And we go to NASDAQ because it has the rates and it has quotes that people are talking about about the market. If I didn't go to Ariel, I wouldn't know how much I would be spending in storing. I wouldn't know how to save because sometimes you'll, you'll see like two for five and that makes you think that you have to buy two. But really, you only have to buy one. So some people get tricked by that. Investment class, I've learned how to trade stocks and invest stocks and how to research stocks and analyze. I'm pretty good at what I do and I know a lot about stocks and companies and I actually have a, my own stock portfolio. Who thinks the U.S. has a lot of investments? Derek, what do you think? Students learn about investing, they learn about economics concepts that most kids in public schools don't even get exposure to at such a young age, and they also have the added aspect of an international investments course in the seventh grade. So they're really creating well-rounded students who have an understanding of economics, investing, and the international component. Not a lot of people, like just in this community, know about investing in stocks and 
the stock market and how all of that works. My mother would be like, what did you learn? I'd be like, yeah, I learned about some of the stocks and the stock market and stuff. And she'd be like, oh, I need you to help me with this sometimes. I'm saving for when I get to high school and college for books and everything. And just for me, just to have. I think that I am actually ahead of some other kids that aren't learning about investments and others in stocks because we get on to subjects like, um, like basically, I remember I've gotten to a fight with my friend about the war in Iraq. And I look at it from a business perspective. She looks at it from, well, if we pull out, that, that, that's going to happen. I'm like, well, if we pull out, that, that, that's going to happen to the economy. She's like, why are you talking about the economy? Our students are learning um, anything from what's scarcity and what is opportunity cost all the way to um, what's the best investment in their um, stock portfolios and should they, um, if they bought Apple now and something comes out with Apple, should they buy, sell, or hold? So that whole spectrum is where they go from kindergarten through eighth grade. Who doesn't love to talk about money? That's really makes it fun. So we give our kids $20,000 in first grade, real money and it follows them through their grade school career. They take over increasing responsibilities for managing the money. When they're in eighth grade, they give $20,000 back to the incoming first grade class to make the program self-perpetuating. In sixth grade, they start picking their own stocks. They, pick, they take a quarter of the portfolio, seventh grade, half of the portfolio, eighth grade, the full portfolio. To replicate what, we did, what John Rogers had as a child, they get statements at home every quarter, so they get mail. And um, the profits at the end of the grade school career are split half where they have to make a philanthropic contribution because our kids are inner city kids. And the other half, they split. And for every child that will put the money in a 529 plan for college, we give them an additional $1,000. So that we're trying to teach them about matching and 401k plans early. Last year, we had 44 kids graduate, 42. We asked their parents to let them make their own decision, put the money in the 529 plan for college. And so this has been our real life experience. Our school is 14 years old now. So we've had three graduating classes. And these kids are absolutely and completely obsessed with the stock market. Because to them, it's like sports. Now, my favorite part, my favorite last closing story about the kids, our kids come to our office to sing Christmas carols. So they have a choir. There are 440 kids in our school. We share the building with the University of Chicago Charter School. Ours is not a charter school because it happened before there was charter school legislation in Chicago. The mayor gave nine institutions the right to run a school. There were hundreds of applications, and we actually won one. They asked us to name our school Ariel, which we had some trepidation about because there had never been a black company to have a school. So they thought that that would send a really great message to the community. Now I have to tell you, when you put your company name on a school, you think about it in a totally different way. It's not something you ever can walk away from. So we were a little nervous about that, saying, wow, you know, we, our reputation and could be augmented or affected in a negative way by doing this, but ultimately we decided to do it. And it's been a great, wonderful experiment and great experience for us. But getting back to the Christmas Carol. So they came to, Chicago, to Ariel. Our building's at the Aeon Center, which is a landmark building in Chicago, on the 29th floor. So the kids come to do sing Christmas carols. And as you saw, they all wear uniforms, you know, blue shirts and light blue shirts and dark pants and ties and things for girls. So they come in to sing the carols. And the teacher comes up to me and she says, Ms. Hobson, Julia did not wear her uniform today. Julia was nine years old. So I'm looking down on her, this is a few years ago, you know, she's little, and I'm like, Julia, it's very, very important, I didn't know her, it's very, very important for you to do what your teacher says, and it's very important that you wear your uniform, and I'm going into, you know, the speech that we've all had, right, from our parents. So Julia looks up at me and she says, no, you do not understand. This T-shirt is Old Navy, and we own the Gap. And this is advertising, because that stock needs help. I still well up when I tell the story. And I looked at her and I said, they get it, they get it. They think like owners. Julia's trying to move the Gap stock in our office. So I know what this can do, and I hope as you go out into the world and do all the unbelievably great things that you will do, that you'll remember this one small, growing problem 
its disproportionate effect on the minority communities, and what it ultimately means for all of American society. So thank you very, very much for having me. I'm happy to take a few questions. Do you have any plans to expand this school concept to within Chicago and even outside of the state? What we've been doing, we've, we've have three initiatives going on. One, we actually have, I've hired a person full time at Ariel who actually splits his time, I should say, between us and the Chicago Public School System. He works for Arnie Duncan, who runs the Chicago Public School System, who came from our office before he went to run the school system. Arnie actually was the, found, the father and, and, and uh, thought leader behind our school and is now running the third largest school system in America. Peter Cunningham, who works for us, is full-time spending his life trying to get financial literacy in schools, both in Chicago and nationally. So we've engaged a lobbyist firm in Washington, and we're working with congressional leaders to really put this on the agenda. As you might expect from Chicago, we're good friends with Barack, and we've also raised this issue with him as well. So we've decided, instead of me talking about it this year, I said we're hiring someone and this is their job to get this done. Secondly, in Chicago, we've gone to some of the biggest uh, most successful families in Chicago, and we said the aerial program should be replicated. We need $20,000 for every school. And if we just start with the one, the first 20 through the first one through eight, then the program becomes self perpetuating. We've estimated that, that we need $20 million to put it in every school. So we're trying to find uh, like minded people who will contribute to that. Thirdly, we are actually formalizing our financial curriculum so that any school in America could ask for the aerial curriculum and get it off the shelf with beautiful workbooks and lesson plans and be able to go from there. The one major obstacle is we have to teach the teachers. It's not like the teachers have been uh, savvy about investments as well, so we had to do a lot of work with our teachers just to get them aware of this. We have full-time investment teachers at Ariel that we pay for that would never be in a school system um, budget, so we recognize we've got to figure out ways to tweak this program. We can't do more schools because we're actually an investment company, <laughs> not a school company, and we spend about a million dollars a year on this just out of our own pocket. So. We, that's the Cadillac version. We have 11 full-time people. Our principal has an assistant. We have all sorts of things that most schools don't have. But we do think there's a Chevy version that can be done and that other companies can take up. Yes. Hi, thank you for coming. What could we do here in business schools or other professional schools like law school, medical school? Because my hunch is that beyond just the seventh grade kids, that this might actually be a difference even at the Stanford undergraduate level, even amongst our community here. So what could we do to help this effort? Well, it's interesting. Um, one of the people that we worked with with Charles Schwab and company for a long time was a woman named Carla Foster. And Carla went to Stanford Business School. And Carla told me she worked at Schwab in a very senior level. She said, I had no idea about investing either, and I've gone to the best schools in society, in America, in the world. And um, so we do recognize, you know, I didn't have, I mean, maybe if you took corporate finance somewhere, you have some sense of these things, but, you know, most of us don't really get that front row view. So even in, in the elite schools, for lack of a better term, it's an issue. In terms of what you can do, I think a lot of what you can do is when you walk out of these doors, one, you're going to be inside great organizations. So many, I know business school students are going into the financial services field. You could spur a company to take on this effort by having a school as well. And also asking companies to look at their 401k plan by race. Those are two things that actually seem so small but could make a difference. Thirdly, I tell people replicate the John Rogers story. Give stocks for, to nieces and nephews and children for birthdays and Christmas. Instead of buying the PlayStation, buy the Sony shares. Maybe not Sony because it hasn't done so well, but <laughs> it, so that you socialize children to saving and investing, investing at a very early age. Everyone in this room could do that. And then last but not least, you can talk about the problem. Because I feel like if we start a grassroots movement around this, we'll actually end up moving the needle. Melody, on behalf of the Black Business Students and the Graduate School of Business, we offer you a bottle of uh, Vision Cellars wine. It's a black vintner. We decided to support um, black entrepreneurs as much as we could in this conference. Thank you so much for your time and your gracious words and your intelligent thoughts and your beauty and your humor. 
Well, thank, thank you so you. much for having me. I just need that letter, though. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Did you <laughs> To tell you the punchline to this because it's it's very very good so I'm gonna give him the letter so my boyfriend I've spent a lot of time in San Francisco is George Lucas so George said to me if he says there is no night school tell him if I gave him a hundred million dollars could they be a night school just so that I can trump you so I suggest you put in a call to him